the speeds. Do you feel like giving up? Anybody ever felt like giving up? Yeah. Anybody felt like giving up this week? Telling you. So we read earlier about Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. I will not read the scripture into your hearing again. You've heard it once before. We'll touch base on it throughout the sermon this morning. Um, but think about that. Do you ever feel like getting up? Let's pray. Um, we've all felt like giving up at some point or another. I ask that this morning you speak through me your words, your message. May they be encouraging to someone. Lord, help us to not give up to realize that you are in control. That no matter how bad things may seem, we've already won because we're in. And as the song said, there's still so much more worth fighting for. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you're going to do. Amen. Amen. Every once in a while in life, we all reach a point where we're just ready to throw in the towel and give up. We're tired, we're frustrated and exhausted, and feel like there's no use in continuing to try. Whether it's a job or a relationship or health-related problems, whether it's work or school or trying to lose weight, whatever it is, sometimes we just don't see the light at the end of the time. And rather, um, we'd rather just quit fighting sometimes. I know I've been there, probably in all of those categories at some point or another, where you just get tired of fighting and you just feel like giving up. Many years ago, there was a man in Kentucky who had recently retired from the Postal Service. He was sitting on his front porch when his first Social Security check arrived and he looked around and he, he looked at it and felt so frustrated and thought to himself, this this is all I have to look forward to for the rest of my life, this little bitty check. He put in a long, hard career delivering the mail, and he had very little to show for it. He was beginning to wonder all those years had it been worth the hard work. So he sat down and he made a list of his blessings and all the good things he had going for him. And included in that was his mother's famous recipe for fried chicken which included 11 different herbs and spices. He was the only one who knew the recipe, and he went to a nearby restaurant and asked if he could cook the chicken, and they said yes. Pretty soon, it became the most popular item at the restaurant. So he opened his own restaurant and called it what? Fried Kentucky Fried Chicken. And the rest is history. Harlan Sanders was tired and frustrated, but he counted his blessings. There is a terrible health problem running its course through our land, and it's one of the worst illnesses around. It's a universal disease, and it's highly contagious. And if you're around someone who has it, you can catch it fairly quickly. It's called the disease of discouragement. Discouragement has been defined as the feeling of despair in the face of obstacles, and it's when you're tired of giving forth effort, and you really just want to give it give it up and call it good. We've all been there, haven't we? You may even be there now, ready to give up on whatever you've been battling for so long. The reading in the book of Nehemiah is a great story about both the causes and the cures for discouragement. Many years earlier in the history of Israel, the walls of Jerusalem had been destroyed and the people were now defenseless and vulnerable to their enemies. Nehemiah was called by God to lead the people in rebuilding the walls. But it seemed like an impossible task, and the moral and the morale of the people was low. They were very discouraged and couldn't see any light at the end of the time. 
So we're going to look at the story of the rebuilding of the wall and discover the causes for discouragement. The very first one was fatigue. In verse 10, we read, we grow weak in carrying our burdens. You ever been weak from carrying burdens? <coughs> you know, they say that you can take a glass of water and you can hold it, and you can hold it, and you can hold it. And at first, it's like no big deal, right? It's just a glass of water. But the longer you hold this glass of water, the heavier it gets. The size of the burden doesn't change. The amount of water in here doesn't change. But if you haven't gotten yourself in shape, if you're not strong enough, eventually your arm will begin to drop because the glass gets heavier and heavier as we get weaker and weaker from carrying the same thing around. The burden doesn't change, but our weaknesses begin to show. We grow weak carrying our burdens. In the South, we would say that the workers have just done give out. You ever feel give out? Some days I feel give out. These people had worked hard for a long time, and now they were just totally exhausted. When you're physically tired and worn down, it's almost impossible to be emotionally and spiritually up. So what is the best thing to do when you feel fatigued, when you feel tired? You get some rest. It's real simple. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just go to bed and get some sleep. Just to remind you, it is not spiritual to do that at church. So don't fall asleep this morning. All right? I don't see anybody nodding out there. But honestly, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go to bed and get some rest. God will speak to you as he restores your body. He will speak to you in your dreams. Isn't it amazing how much better you feel after you get a full night's sleep? Now, I'm not talking about those little four or five hour nights. I'm talking a full eight, nine hour nights. Probably been a long time since a lot of us have had that kind of sleep. For me, I'm an eight to nine hour a night gal to get the full amount of sleep that I need. Usually, I don't get near that much. So I get run down. And I'm sure some of y'all do as well. Fatigue can often lead to discouragement. We get frustrated, we get short with people, we get a little fuzzy headed. We just get tired. And we get tired of being tired. So it's, a pro it's important to get the proper amount of rest. <clears throat> Fatigue and discouragement usually occur when you're halfway through whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. In verse 6 we read, So we went on rebuilding the wall, and soon it was half its full height because the people were eager to work. Everyone has energy at the beginning of a new task, but about halfway through, we're beginning to wonder if we're going to make it. You know, whenever we start a new project, people are like, oh, I want to help, oh, I want to help, oh, I want to help. And you come to the first meeting, everybody's all pumped up, and you come to the second meeting, and there's a few less people, and you come to the third meeting, and there's a few less people, and by the fourth or fifth meeting, you're meeting with yourself and your cup of coffee because everybody's going to give up. They've gotten distracted, they're tired, they've moved on to other things. When you reach the midpoint of climbing a mountain, you see how far you've come and how far you've got to go. You are tired and wondering if you should even try to continue. That's why so many people never finish what they start because halfway there, they're worn out and they give up. Are you worn out and discouraged? Get the rest that you need and that will help solve it won't solve it completely, but it will help solve the problem. The second thing is frustration. In verse 10, we read, there is so much rubble. In trying to rebuild the wall, they discovered that there was litter and debris and trash lying in the way. Broken bricks and mortar were getting in the way, and they became frustrated. Whether it's at home or at work, it just seems like rubble never goes away, does it? You accomplish one task, and there's another one to be done. And before long, you're feeling frustrated and irritable. Anybody got some trouble in their life? You're doing some good things. You're working. You're rebuilding your life. But there's still that one. 
Some of it's casualty from that rebuilding, right? Some of it's just trash. We haven't had the strength to sweep away yet. We keep hoping some big Holy Ghost wind is going to come through and blow it. But sometimes it takes us doing that physical removal of that trash so that way we know that it's going to We got rubble, y'all. Yep. We got rubble. You can't avoid the rubble, but you can become able to recognize it and know what to do with it. And if you don't know what to do with it, you'll never reach your goal. Rubble is anything in your life that keeps you from accomplishing your goals. You made New Year's resolutions but found that the rubble was getting in the way. Perhaps your goal was to read your Bible more often, but you found that there's too much noise. Perhaps you wanted to lose weight, but find there's too many snacks around the house. That's real. Uh-huh. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I tell you, I have that problem. You've got to be able to recognize the rubble and know what to do with it. I want to give you a clue on something that's a big piece of rubble in a lot of people's lives. Sometimes it's a 32 inch, and sometimes it's a 60 inch, and sometimes it's somewhere in between. It has bright flashing pictures on it, and a whole lot of noise, and a whole lot of choices. Even now. Even now. That brings rubble in your house. Even the, the snack now it brings good, rubble in your mind, it brings rubble in your spirit. It distracts you a lot of times from doing what you're supposed to be doing. I agree. I'll say amen on that. Amen. All right. I'm not saying get rid of your TV. I'm saying hide the remote somewhere where you can get where it is so it's a little bit more difficult to watch it. Or just put it away for a while. Take a sabbatical from the TV and see how much more you get done. See how much clearer your mind gets. TV can be broken. Okay. So what distracts you? What eats away at your, pro at your productive time? That's your rubble. It will frustrate you and discourage you until you do Thanks, something bro. about it. Number three is failure. In verse 10, we also read, they were discouraged and they said, we cannot rebuild this wall. They didn't meet, meet their deadline in finishing the wall, so they got discouraged and were ready to give up because they had failed. Their confidence is shot and they lose heart. They lose their enthusiasm and they give up because they have failed to accomplish their goal. Failure is a major cause of being discouraged. Just about the time I think I'm going to make ends meet, someone moves the ends. The question is, how do you respond to failure? How do you respond when you don't accomplish your goals on time? Do you blame yourself or do you blame someone else? People have learned, who have learned to win in life have learned to get back on the horse after it's bucked them off. John Wayne said, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. Successful people see failures not as the end, but as a temporary setback. Never give up when you have failed. Scripture tells us that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Number four is fear. Verse 11. Our enemies thought we would not see them or know what was happening until they were already upon us, killing us and putting an end to our work. Their enemy was doing everything they could to see that the wall would not be rebuilt. They ridiculed them, they criticized them, and finally they threatened them. And the Jewish people were discouraged because of their fear of being hurt or even losing their lives. Verse 12 says, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Fear certainly causes us to be discouraged. I ask you, and I ask myself, what are our fears today? Do you have a fear of failure? A fear of rejection? Do you have a fear of health problems? A fear of being criticized? Fear will certainly cause feelings of discouragement in our lives. And when you are discouraged over fear in your life, the only thing you want to do is pack your bags and leave. The bad thing is when you leave, fear and discouragement are never far behind you. So in this story, we see four things that cause us to feel discouraged. Fatigue, frustration, failure, and fear. If you're feeling discouraged today, you can be sure that one of these four things is the central cause of it. In this story, we have seen some causes of discouragement, 
But now let's look at the cures for discouragement. The first one, which I mentioned earlier, rest your body. When you read this whole chapter, Nehemiah actually gives his people some holidays. He gives them some time off to get the proper rest that they need. As I've already mentioned, one of the simplest and best things you can do with discouragement is get away and get some rest. It is not a sin of laziness to do this. Jesus often got away by himself to get the rest that he needed. In our busy schedules, we make the excuse that we don't have the time to rest. We have too many things to do. Well, if you can't make the time to rest now, you'll find time to rest in the hospital later on. I remember when, uh, back a number of years ago, Rev made national news with some stance that he took in a very public forum. And he began to work feverishly with media calls Me and calls from people wanting him to speak. And he was traveling here, there, and yonder, and he didn't take the time to rest. And he ended up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any of y'all were here then or not. Calvin, you probably remember that. Miss Claudia, you remember that. Cool. Yeah. And that was a scary time. Yeah. I know there have been times in my life where I have literally worn myself out, thinking I was doing good for other folk, not realizing I was doing everything halfway and wasn't really doing good for anybody and was doing worse for myself because I didn't take care of myself. So you have to make time to rest. Psalm 127 2 said, in vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for the food to eat. He grants sleep to those he loves. God created your body to work, but he also created it to get good rest it needs in order to do the work that is required. So it's important that God made it one of the Ten Commandments, saying that on the seventh day it's, it's set aside for rest. Number two, and the cure. You need to reorganize your life. Verse 13 says, so I armed the people with swords and spears and bows and stationed them by families behind the wall wherever it was unfinished. Nehemiah didn't give up on the goal of rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. He just reorganized the people and put them in their proper places. When you are discouraged, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are doing the wrong thing. It may mean that you're doing the right thing, but in the wrong way. Hmm. God is not asking you to give up on your dreams. Just go after them in a different way. His way. This morning on the way here, I said to Karen that discernment can sometimes be negative. When we're looking at the way we do things, God's way as opposed to our way, we may run into people in our life who are very discouraging of the things that we're trying to do. Sometimes that's a word from the Lord. Sometimes people have the gift of discernment and they're trying to tell you it's not that you have a bad idea, but you need to go about it the way God would go about it. He's given you a vision, he's given you a dream, but you've got to follow his steps and his pathway to get there. Don't, don't try to do it on your own boot, because if you do, you're going to fail. Listen to those people. Now, not every negative word is from the Lord. But surround yourself with those who have discernment, who have a direct line, and talk to them and listen to them when they give you words. And then pray on it. Anytime anybody gives you advice about how to reorganize or redo something that you know the Lord has called you to do, you better pray on it and make sure, one, they're not trying to steal your dream, but two, that they're trying to be uplifting and try to direct you in the ways of the Lord. That's just for somebody out there. I don't know who, but I'm just saying. Again, God is not asking you to give up on your dreams. Just go after them in a different way, His way. So that means that we have to reorganize it and do it in a different way. 
If you're in debt, reorganize and do things differently. If you're wanting to lose some weight, reorganize your eating patterns. If you're overcommitted, reorganize your time. To beat discouragement doesn't mean that you give up and quit. Simply reorganize and do things differently. Notice that Nehemiah grouped them by families. That's because we need each other in our homes and at church. Throughout the Bible, we hear the phrase, one another. God knows that we need each other to keep to keep us from getting discouraged. We are told to love one another, to encourage one another, to serve one another, to pray for one another. We need the support of our families, of this family, at home and at church, in order to keep us from getting discouraged. If you're feeling discouraged today, reorganize, make some changes, and find support from your family at home in church. Number three in the cure is remember the Lord. Verse 14, do not be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. When feeling discouraged and worn out, you must get reconnected and recharged with God. When feeling discouraged, you must get connected to the source. Typically, when we feel discouraged, we've got our eyes on the problem and off the Lord. We need to remember our source for living in times of discouragement and to get reconnected. Remember God's faithfulness to you in the past. Remember his closeness to you in the present. And remember his power for you in the future. When feeling discouraged, get your mind off the problem and onto the Lord and remember who he is and all he's done for you. The best way to do this is to make some time to spend in his word. King David said in Psalm 119.25, I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. Over and over again through the Bible, God tells us to be encouraged. He assures us of his presence and his faithfulness in all of our discouraging times. But you'll never know it unless you read it for yourself. Remember the Lord and get reconnected by studying his word. And finally, number four, resist the discouragement. In verse 14, Nehemiah says to fight for your family and your home. Don't give up. Don't roll over and play dead. Get in the battle and fight for what's important to you. Resist the discouragement. Keeping us discouraged is one of Satan's biggest weapons against us. The Bible reminds us that we're not fighting against those things that are physical, but against spiritual forces. Satan knows that if you or I are discouraged, he's won the battle because we won't feel like doing anything godly in our lives. You must make the choice to resist discouragement and continue to fight. And discouragement is always a choice, not just a feeling. You choose to stay on the ground or get back up on the horse. But know that if you're on the ground, Satan is satisfied. Resist the discouragement in your life. Fight for your families and your homes. When you exit through the doors of the church today, you must determine what is causing the discouragement in your life. Is it fatigue? Are you tired? Is it frustration? Is it failure? Are you not where you thought you'd be a year ago in your recovery, in your life, in your finances? Is it fear? Are you scared of what's around you? Are you scared to step out in faith? Once you have discovered it, you must do something about it. Rest, reorganize, remember, and reconnect with God. Resist it, reload, and keep fighting the battle, but never give up. But perhaps the most important thing to do when feeling discouraged is simply to pray. David felt discouraged through the Psalms, and he told God how he felt. When was the last time that you had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with God, and you really told him how you felt? Not a our Father who art in heaven kind of conversation. Not a Lord bless me and keep me kind of conversation. But a 
God, I am mad as heck. I am frustrated as I'll get out. I'm about to give up on this thing kind of conversation. You got to get real, real. He knows what's going on anyway. He doesn't need flowery words and lots of these and nouns. He wants a genuine, authentic conversation. He's waiting to hear from you. He doesn't care whether you're angry or depressed, frustrated or worried. He just wants to hear from you. So I encourage you this morning. If you feel like giving up, do something for me. Step out in faith. Put all your eggs in one basket. And then give that basket to God. Take a chance. He will restore you. He will help you rebuild the walls that protect your life. The walls that keep you safe. He will help rebuild whatever it is that is good and positive in your life. He will help you fulfill your dreams if you follow his way. You feel yeah. like giving up. Go to God. That's right. Tell him how you feel. Tell him what you want. He'll tell you what you need. Yes. Make sure those line up. And then be prepared to be restored and renewed. And to get rid of your discouragement.